So, we have come to the end of our text here on transforming suffering and happiness. Um, what I thought is to do just a quick recap uh, what we've been working on. Again, this is a text um, from the Tibetan Buddhist canon from a uh, primarily a Nyingma uh, master from the 19th century named uh, Dodrupchen Tempe Nyingma, who was, I don't know exactly what years, but it was the 19th century, um, East Tibet. And he was a really profound, uh, profoundly realized master. And this text has a flavor of kind of his style and lineage, as well as um, a connection to a deeper tradition of Lozhong, right? So every class I've mentioned, Lozhong, uh, this, this Tibetan word, which directly translates as mind training, Lo being, being mind. Low meaning mind and zhang meaning training, right? So this category of mind training has uh, two main traditions uh, from India that kind of got um, brought into Tibet via Atisha, who was a figure, I believe, in the 10th century. So this is really old stuff, but I think it's more applicable than ever now in the sense that Lozhang is really about, uh, in one way, transforming adversity when we're trying to be a spiritual practitioner in the world, uh, in this case a Buddhist practitioner from the perspective of this text, and we're going to nonetheless face all kinds of obstacles as we try to do that. It's not a smooth ride necessarily, right? So in one way we're learning to transform and open our heart uh, and having methods to do that. And then also uh, Lozhong has this aspect of kind of exchanging ourselves for others. So it, it the, the probably most famous practice within Lozhong is the practice of Tonglen, which you know, means right to, to exchange oneself for another, to imagine taking on someone else's suffering and offering them our happiness, which from a worldly perspective sounds completely insane. <laughs> you know, it's, it's sort of like uh, most people would be like, no, thank you. Like I'll, you know, but that's not the point, right? The point is that we were not literally in the beginning, or I, would, I should say, Generally, we're not literally taking something on, but we're training the mind. Uh, we're training the mind in the responsibility of being willing to do that. And we start to open our heart. We start to open our uh, uh, space more to the possibility that others are just as worthy as, our, as ourselves of happiness, love, well-being, and awakening, enlightenment. And we start to make them even more important than ourselves. This can go also kind of a funny direction in the West. So I like to bring this up in the sense that if we are not secure in our own self-confidence, it can also go a strange direction where it's, it, the practice is not about self-deprecation, is I think what I'm trying to say. So we do need some kind of relative form of, of um, healthy self-esteem, health, healthy self-confidence to practice this. Because then we recognize, hey, I'm okay. Like, I feel, I mean, of course... You know, we all have our ups or downs, but when we have a healthy sense of self-confidence, it's like, okay, I'm okay. So now I want to shift into growing my capacity and challenging myself and, and, and growing my capacity for compassion and love, as well as for wisdom, as we see in this text. So really this text is in the, I'm kind of going over two ways because it's really in the context of a practitioner seeking awakening or seeking enlightenment from the Buddhist perspective. But at the same time, these tools I think can be applicable to any of us wherever our motivations and intentions are. Um, the premise here uh, is just the basic Buddhist principle based on the Four Noble Truths that suffering or unsatisfactoriness or what we call in Sanskrit and Pali dukkha is just going to happen to us. It's unavoidable. It's just part of life, right? And that not being uh, that being a fact, also it's not the kind of um, surrender that that's our only choice, right? I mean, we're stuck with that predicament right now for a while, but the Buddhist premise is that we can actually eliminate, not just reduce, we can actually eliminate dukkha. Because if we understand and come into a deeper uh, perspective of its actual causes, both as grosser causes of sort of our behavior of craving, aversion, and ignorance, and sort of working with that, as well as its underlying causes, which is uh, what we call the root of misknowing or misapprehension. Some people use the term ignorance, but I think it's more like we're, uh, the idea that we're having a misperception or, or misknowing. So this text, um, last week, we really focused on that deeper aspect 
Most of this particular text is focusing on more what we call relative practices of recognizing um, the unavoidability of suffering um, and that, as I put it the uh, last few times, uh, avoiding the problem is the problem <laughs> often. So it's first just a very direct recognition in this text. He points out, hey, why, why not just accept this is happening and then work with it instead of just constantly trying to run away and avoid this sense of dukkha or unsatisfactoriness in life. So it's very practical advice. So it starts out with relative advice like that and then the text moves through um, all kinds of advice for exchanging ourselves with others, for recognizing, hey, we're not the most important person in the world in the sense like we're just a person. We are important, but everyone's important. Everyone's precious. And so we start to train in that directly, right? And this isn't just for then giving up our own needs it's for training in a vaster mind we call bodhicitta, right? Which is a mind of awakening based on compassion and love. So then from there, it's um, sort of elements of working with suffering. Uh, he, you know, he gave this advice of seeing suffering as an ally to help us along the path. So even though it's unavoidable, we can use it to our advantage, where we can practice compassion when suffering arises. We can practice love. We can practice sort of um, these armor-like patience that I described in one of the sessions. He also advises we can use suffering to train in seeing the unre unreliability of this underlying unsatisfactory nature we call samsara in Buddhism, which means to circle, which I'm going to talk about more today. Um, he said we can use suffering to train in refuge, which means where are we relying or what are we relying on for our happiness, right? Most of us are turning towards means that aren't providing true happiness. Maybe it's a temporary relief, but ultimately what are we going to rely on? And so Buddhism obviously is a fan of relying on the Dharma, meaning the Dharma that will actually help to liberate us. First, it's the Dharma of scripture and teaching just to gain an understanding. And then it's the Dharma of insight that happens inside of us, inside of our minds, right? So these are just different methods he recommends. So I don't have time to review the whole text, but just kind of going through that. I really think there was this nice point um, we talked on, I think the time before last, of just recognizing the need for solitude. Um, and I would even say within that, recognizing the need for help. Like, we can't do this on our own. We need community. We need teachers. We need all kinds of different levels of teachers. Uh, we need spiritual community. Um, and we need solitude sometimes, right? It's hard to do this stuff in the middle of Manhattan. Uh, we should try. <laughs> but then sometimes it's good to go away and practice more, specifically when we're not being bombarded with people doing the exact opposite, right? So it's, it's, that, that is not a, I would say that's not considered a failure here. That's considered like, uh, healthy self-care, to use a modern term, <laughs> Buddhist self-care, right? Go into some solitude sometimes. So also, you know, these kinds of texts are famous for kind of like pointing out the benefits, because if we don't understand the benefits, why are we going to want to do it? So some of the benefits I mentioned, but there's a lot he goes through in the text, is our character will become more peaceful, will become more open and flexible, will be more confident, We'll be able to work with negative circumstances as they arise, instead of getting completely sucked into them, right? Um, and our mind will become more content and happy. <laughs> so I think these are, everyone would, I don't think anyone would say, no, I don't want that. These are things we're all searching for. Um, there's a quote I really love. I'm trying to remember its author who said it, but it's a Tibetan Buddhist master or an Indian master who said, um, uh, sentient beings, run towards suffering and run away from happiness. <laughs> and it's something to really think about because that sounds odd in the sense that most of us, it, it looks like we are pretty much, I don't know, I was thinking about it one day and I was like, do I do anything that's not just in service of sort of temporarily trying to get away from some pain or temporarily trying to seek some pleasure, right? It seems like the majority of my actions are for that. But what he's actually saying is, most of us run towards the causes of suffering, not towards the causes of happiness. But the problem is, and this is where we have to have compassion for ourselves and others, is that's, a, that's the fundamental ignorance of not knowing the causes of happiness and the causes of suffering, right? So that's what we're going to begin to point out today in this last part of the text, is get a little deeper into that. Um, 
there was this, this brief section on transforming suffering through recognizing its ultimate nature, which is probably one of the, I call it deep end Buddhism. It's some of the more challenging aspects of the Dharma. Uh, we call the, the prajna or, or wisdom side of Buddhism, where we're recognizing the nature of reality. Uh, we're trying to recognize, are we having a projection? Is our experience real as it is? Or is there some kind of projection, illusion, self-making, you know, going on, right? And is that creating happiness for ourselves or suffering? So this is deep end Buddhism in that it's very difficult for most of us to see this right away. It takes practice of meditation, of seeing clearly, like even the one we just did where we watch the body and emotions or feelings, eventually we'll see more clearly that these emotions what's arising, it's happening to us, but where can we find some solidified identity? So we start to find more openings in there for more possibilities, right? So we went over that um, in a few ways last week, but we mostly spent time on, on this way, he says, uh, by means of reasoning such as the refutation of production from the four extremes, um, the mind is drawn towards emptiness, this quality of openness, uh, free from suffering, the natural condition of things, the supreme state of peace, and there it rests. In this state, let alone harmful circumstances or suffering, not even their names can be found. So this is really what we would call the ultimate cut, right? Cutting through the, the, the root delusion of uh, ignorance or a misapprehension or misperception itself. Like I said, very difficult to go for someone to just go from beginner to that. So we have lots of stages in order to help with that. And in a way, all of the relative means of developing compassion and love is also a means uh, for getting at this. Because the more we understand and we start to open up our, our sort of cocoon of self and the contraction we're often doing into self, not only do we, do we become more happy, but we start to see that self isn't a thing. And that self isn't as solid and fixed as we thought it was, right? And therefore we start to find freedom. Now from a Buddhist perspective, we would say that is the genuine nature of reality. It's its underlying nature. It's just that we're not recognizing that. So I guess one could argue, well, that's Buddhist philosophical perspective. But I think the answer back is like, if we just watch experience and we give time to bear witness, this is what we'll come to. And many traditions come to something, not just Buddhism, many meditators and practitioners over the years, they come to some sort of sense of this. They may call it different names in different traditions, but there's some sense that things are not as fixed and real as they appear. So ultimately that is the giant cut. We would say that's like the getting at the root of the tree rather than just cutting its branches. Yeah? So now we are on to our last section. It's interesting because he put this section last, um, the, this section called How to Use Happiness as the Path to Enlightenment, on purpose. Uh, and I've thought a lot about this. Um, this is a really hard thing to recognize. I mean, even as I say it, I'm, I'm curious what you all think, but how to use happiness as the path to enlightenment in the sense that and, and, you know, we have our title of it being Transforming Suffering and Happiness. So I was wondering, are you all thinking, why would I want to transform happiness? Is that a thought? No? I have a guess. <laughs> guess, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's an interesting question. Like, what is the, maybe another a better way to phrase it is, is there a problem with happiness? Would you, would you normally think that? <laughs> like, if you're happy... Do you think I'm having a problem right now? <laughs> you're special. <laughs> yeah, so we're not gonna we're not gonna count you. Well, you're you're in your own. <laughs> yeah. No. No. I mean that. Yeah. Wonderful question to ask. It's true. I mean that's as a true spiritual seeker. That's what we're asking. Is that any more real? No. I mean it's not any more real than the suffering itself, right? Um, but the issue here is, is, first of all, why we would want to transform happiness, which I'll get to. And then second, um, if we come to the premise that we do, uh, what's the, you know, again, what's the purpose of that? Why would we want to 
is happiness in the sense how we seek it and how we often experience it, is that truly a refuge for ourselves? Is that truly useful? That's the question here, right? So his opening verse here um, says, whenever happiness and the various things that cause happiness appear, if we slip under their power, then we'll grow incre increasingly conceited, smug, and lazy, which will block our spiritual path and progress. So this is really kind of, I would say, like hardcore Buddhism. This is for someone who's a serious practitioner of Buddhism who really understands that no matter where we're at in the world, whether we're happy or suffering, we're still bound. So the Buddha often described this as, you know, whether someone binds us with iron chains or gold chains, you're still bound, right? And this is very difficult to understand because pleasure, happiness, is something very sticky where it feels good initially. And so we then fall under its power that we think it's going to lead where that good, that pleasure will stay forever, right? And so the Buddha asked us to look deeper. So I think some framework would help here uh, to kind of draw it out more, which is usually we frame it in three types of dukkha, right? You all have heard this before, I think. No? Okay. So we, we <laughs> that's all good. So we have the dukkha of dukkha, or the, the suffering of suffering, right? Mm -hmm. And then we have the suffering of change, and then the, what we call pervasive compounding suffering in Tibetan Buddhism, or Mayana Buddhism. So suffering of suffering, I think, is pretty obvious, you know, it's, it's what we would normally label suck, and, you know, this sucks, I don't want this, right? Sickness, old age, death, all of that, right? When something doesn't go right, when we end up in a bad mood, etc. The second category of suffering of change is usually something most of us don't see. Uh, it, it takes actually quite a lot of awareness to see it, um, and it's that momentary, momentary change where once we're having an experience, it's only downhill from there in the sense that it's going to change. It's impermanent. So this is really what we're talking about now. I don't, I'm not going to go into the third category uh, because we can just stay with the second type of suffering, the suffering of change. The example they use is often um, like when we sit down, it may feel pleasurable to sit down and then over a certain period of time, the body's going to be uncom uncomfortable, we're going to have to stand up. So the premise here is that even in that moment of, ah, it feels good to sit, right? Even that ah is suffering. And that's a, again, this is, you know, some people then complain about Buddhism that, oh, it's all about suffering. But no, it's not. It's about rec recognizing where are we going to place our reliance, you know? What are we going to take refuge in? Is it a problem sitting? No, not at all. We have a body, we need to take care of it. But how much are we gonna rely on that sitting for our ultimate happiness? That's what we're really talking about here. So for a hardcore practitioner, meaning someone who really wants to wake up, they really wanna attain enlightenment for the benefit of sentient beings, um, they don't want anything impeding their spiritual progress, including like it's, I think of it like, if, I just, if you just put a bath of honey here, and it just like, if you just dropped into that honey, what would that feel like? I mean, it's, it's very indulgent. Some people would be like, ooh, that sounds good. <laughs> what? Gross. Gross, yeah. To me, it feels like so sticky and, you know, like uh, just, I like honey, but, <laughs> you know, it's just so like, uh, it's, it's almost like too, you know, those, have you ever had like too much indulgence where it's like, like over the holidays, you eat a meal that's so much sweets and so much food and it's almost like, it's exhausting, the amount of pleasure. You see what I'm saying? You know, or you fall in love with someone and there's those first few weeks of just like, like you're in honey, you know? And at some point you have to come out of it and it changes. But even the indulgence in itself feels sticky. And what does that indulgence do? Um, there's nothing wrong with it in and of itself. But what does it do to our minds? It tends to make us forget what's meaningful. It tends to actually encourage an enclosure or a contraction into the self, into our self-absorption. I mean, and again, I put that out there for, for y'all to think about in your own life and to reflect on. So, in essence, this is all about setting us up to practice the path of awakening, to understand how we're bound and to actually free, right? Free ourselves and others. So, there's a quote here from Padampa Sangye, which I think that quote that I said where sentient beings run towards suffering and run away from happiness, um, I think it's also Padampasanga. He was an Indian master um, who 
actually he's the the guru of uh, one of the most famous female um, uh, lineage gurus in Tibetan Buddhism named Machik Lobdrum, who, who the Chud tradition. It's called Chud, where you, uh, I don't know, people. I'm moving my hand because people associate it with playing a drum and things like that. But basically, it's a practice of compassion and love where you're you're offering your body to others like to spirits and things like that in order to practice compassion it's a visualization but anyways she um she she headed that and it really is uh, coming from padam basange as well who was her teacher so he says here uh, another quote from him which is in our text which says we human beings can cope with a lot of suffering but very little happiness <laughs> it's a really good quote what he's, what he's implying is that we get so caught up in happiness. It's like, it's like honey. Like f- for me, I'm, I'm like a foodie. So it's just like when there's good food, it's hard for me to stop. You know, it's just like I want to... It's like it's never ending. Uh, the Buddha used examples. It's like drinking salt water. You know, and each of us, I'm sure, has our own vice in our life where it's like, mm, I want more, I want more, I want more, right? So... So uh, the author of our text, Tempe Nima, then goes into, that's why we need to open our eyes in whatever ways we can to the fact that happiness and the things that cause happiness are all actually impermanent and are by nature suffering. So again, coming to this second nature that it's not that we can't enjoy either. They're not saying that. It's not that, hey, if you happen into a good circumstance, it's not that like you have to hate it. You can enjoy it. But the problem is when craving enters the picture, we just want more and we can't stop. And we forget the Dharma. We forget that this is also a projection of our mind. We forget that it's going to change, right? It's going to end. And so I think here, in my personal experience, uh, which is limited, uh, uh, meaning I'm still a you know, practitioner on the path, very much so, beginner practitioner, is that um, when, we, when we look in this way, when we, when we kind of I actually feel we can get more out of this situation. It's sort of like when I notice myself contracting into an experience and craving it more and more, it's actually really constricting. It almost feels like someone's cutting off my air supply when I notice it, right? Which is rarely. But when I open that up to an investigation of, hmm, okay, how can I have this delicious chocolate or whatever, but notice what's arising, right? And, and not try to not get stuck or contracted into it, not let it divert my dharma path, it's actually quite enjoyable. It's more enjoyable than the craving itself. So again, it's not that we have to, we just have to be very careful not to fool ourselves, is I think what they're saying here. So his advice is try your best. He says, so try as best you can to arouse a deep sense of disillusionment and to stop your mind indulging in its usual apathy and negligence, right? (laughs) So So he says here, really the main point to get here is that whatever happiness, whatever well-being comes our way, we must unite it with Dharma practice, right? So we unite it in a way to fuel our um, thirst for liberation, to fuel our thirst to really be of true benefit to others, right? And like I said, there's something that shifts eventually on the path where it just becomes like the normal way of interacting with with phenomena and our, our mind states and emotions just gets super boring. It's super old. It's super like lame, to put it another way. It's very interesting. My, my teacher, uh, Sony Ramshe, he went and visited this really famous Tibetan master who died a few years ago named Chacha Rinpoche. And Chacha Rinpoche, he lived till 104 or something, 103. And he was rever- like really revered in, in Tibetan Buddhism. And he, he spent the latter part of his life in Nepal. And he spent most of his life wandering around Tibet as a wandering yogi. It's a tradition in Tibet where you don't have a home and you just wander and you practice in caves and different places like that. And, um, and so Chacha Rinpoche, not only like a, a, an amazing practitioner in that way, he was also very realized in, in, in the, the Dzogchen path. So he was a master of, of Dzogchen as well as Tantric Buddhism, as well as just, I would say, all of Buddhism. He was an ardent vegetarian, which is pretty, we- it's pretty rare for a Tibetan teacher because Tibet was a culture of a lot of meat eaters just because of the climate. Um, and lack of availability of vegetables. But anyways, he was pretty ardent about vegetarianism. Uh, he wrote about that as well. So anyways, my teacher went to visit him in, in his center in, in Nepal. And he just, uh, my teacher went and just sat in the back. My teacher's also a well-known tuku, uh, Rinpoche, 
And so normally, like a, another tulku, when they enter a space like that, just culturally, they're put in the front and, you know, there's like, what do you call it, preference given to them, right? But he didn't really, he's a pretty simple guy anyways, so uh, he just sat in the back and no one really noticed him, so he just sat there. And the first day, he said the first week he showed up just to kind of get to know this master, Chacharu Mishé, he said he didn't feel anything that special. It was just sort of like, you know, it's traditional for people to come and receive blessings or something, so the teacher will kind of put their hands on the person or offer them something, the person will offer something back. So we see that, and then, you know, they're doing different chant prayer ceremonies during the day. And then after about, he said after about two weeks of coming every day, he started to no notice something really peculiar, where his energy started to shift, to notice that what he called, he said Chacha Rinpoche was more normal than normal. Where it's like, we, we, we normally think like our neurotic mind, our sort of uh, uh, backbiting thinking, our, our sort of mind that is co in competition with others or down and depressed is normal. But he was saying that like Chacha Rinpoche was just like, like a clean slate, like kind of transparent. And he, and he, after about two weeks, he, he started to see the beauty of that. And it wasn't like this grand thing. Like a lot of people think spirituality is like, grand and like you know this I don't know what people think actually but I don't know that's what I used to think you know it's like oh if the Lama is really uh, Lama meaning teacher if they're really powerful and realize it's like like you feel that you know and he was saying it's it almost like nobody there you know but really but but still acting there's still be, um, compassionate conduct right so um I don't know why I brought that up, but um, <laughs> but anyways, there was something oh to like normal, more normal than normal, and so um, anyways, I lost my connection point, but that's okay. I think we we're talking about the main point here is that whatever happiness, whatever well-being comes our way, just really uniting it with Dharma practice and really understanding um, how to bring that in. So. Let's see. So then again, he gives kind of, I want to look at my notes now. So then he kind of closes it out with what this training brings again, which I think is hitting the main point. So he, he, he has this line that says, if we can't practice when we're suffering because of all the anxiety we're going through, right? And we can't practice when we're happy because of our attachment to happiness, meaning we're just stuck in a, like a hamster on a wheel from one experience to the next, then that really rules out any chance of practicing Dharma at all. <laughs> so he said that's why there's nothing more crucial for a practitioner than really training and turning happiness and suffering into the path, right? So here it brings up a, a, an interesting question which I didn't mention yet too, which is, well, wait, if we're not seeking out happiness and we're not seeking out suffering, then what are we seeking out on the Buddhist path? And this definitely is deep end Buddhism, as I call it, but it's good to start talking about it and thinking about it if we're not already, which is enlightenment or awakening is something so beyond how our conceptual mind conceives of these things. You know, we want to think about it as like a smiling person, but that's not what it, I mean, it could be. It could also be a person scowling. It could be anything, actually. Because enlightenment is beyond a duality. It's beyond suffering and it's beyond happiness in this, in this normal sense of how we relate to it and think of it. And the reason being that if we have a state of happiness, we're going to have a state of suffering in our mind. Vice versa, if we have a state of suffering, we're going to have its opposite, right? In a dualistic construct. So awakening in the Buddhist path and enlightenment or liberation really goes beyond all these constructs. It goes beyond the limitations and ideas of who we think we are and what we think other people are and phenomena is, right? And rather, it moves us into the space of not only uh, going beyond our projections, but it moves us deeply into an interdependence that's linked with a compassion that's non-referential. So then, enlightenment is not nothing whatsoever. It's not a complete nihilism, right? Where there's, there's, it's just a void. But at the same time, we move beyond this relationship, this sort of mm, codependent, <laughs> self-absorbed, either we're stuck in happiness or we're stuck in suffering. We go beyond both. And that's why I do think that that, that story about Chacha Rinpoche that, that Sonia Rinpoche was telling is powerful. 
because it's like, what does it look like when it's embodied in a human being? It doesn't, and again, I want to say it doesn't look a certain way. It can look a lot of different ways. But you can tell when someone's coming from an ego structure. And what's it like to meet someone who's out of that structure? I've met a few people like that. It's, it's pretty mind-blowing. Just in itself, when you meet someone, and again, now it's, that's my subjective experience of that, right? So I'm not saying I completely know if they were or not. But um, you can tell when someone's like, there's something, it's like a, I like the analogy of like a glass window or something, but that glass window has heart, right? So there's heart, but it's like you can put your hand right through it. It's quite beautiful. The Dalai Lama is one person in my life who uh, I do think of like that because he's, he's, he can have lots of ranges of emotion. He can have uh, action. There's, there's meaning making in the way he uses his life. But at the same, in the same time, he's so simple, you know? He can be up there like as a big personality, and then there's, it's, it's off the stage, on the stage, it's the same. It's not a big deal, you know? So it's quite rare to meet people like that. But I think if we didn't have those kinds of individuals in the world, and again, not to make a cult of personality here, right? It's about recognizing, hey, if we don't have examples, how are we going to even know it's a possibility for ourselves, right? So... Um, just to wrap this up, and then I want to sort of discuss a little bit. Um, so this is this is the essence of Lojong, how to use both the obstacles, uh, uh, what, what we would normally think of as obstacles, the suffering we run into in the path, and how to use also the obstacle of, of sort of attachment or craving to happiness and pleasure. How do you how to go beyond that in order to become more normal than normal? <laughs> um, so I think I'll open it up now and just. Just curious what you all think, or if there's any questions or any points that kind of hit you that... And again, at least you've been coming, so it could be from other sections of this text, too, if you want. Yeah. Not to put you on the spot. Yeah. <laughs> I think there's a lot Yeah. Even like wishing happiness, yeah. Yeah, I mean, be happy. Um, I guess thinking about happiness maybe in terms of like what our cultural conception of that is. Mm -hmm. um, maybe that's when we're sort of getting stuck, but at the same time, whatever it means, maybe it, maybe just the choice of word. Because happiness, to me, like kind of what I said before, it's just sort of like the flip side of maybe some negative emotion, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, I guess my experience of just sitting and actually just sort of achieve like a neutral space. Mm -hmm. Like I don't feel elated, I don't feel like bursting, you mm -hmm. know, or I don't feel really like down. It's just kind of a new comfortable with neutral mm -hmm. kind of space. Yeah, that's what we would, in the Theravada tradition, they would call that like an equanimous space of neutrality, but, um, which is a good, you know, it's a good thing to access. It's, it's a step on the path to, to have equanimity. Yeah. So if we're not striving for happiness, per se, then what? Yeah, that's what I was trying to allude to, and it's, it's a big question. It's not like something, it's actually, it's much more difficult to talk about what enlightenment is than to talk about the process of how to get there. It's actually easier to talk about how to, how to bring about the path to enlightenment. Um, because it's beyond concept, so it's beyond words. It's ineffable, essentially, is what we're talking about. But they do talk about it in certain Mayana texts, um, like the Uttara Tantra, uh, where it talks about this, what we call Tathagata essence, or, or Buddha nature. Um, and again, it, it's very much in relationship. The more we understand emptiness, or shunyata, the more we understand what Buddhahood is. So it's very interconnected with emptiness. But emptiness, just to be careful with, with my words and maybe your understanding, it's not a nothingness. It's like this, this, this openness, this spaciousness with heart, right? So it's not that it's nothingness in the negative sense. So that's what I was saying. It's not actually neutrality. Um, it's, beyond, it's beyond neutrality or not neutrality. You see what I'm saying? So it's, it's, something really gr it's something really huge that we've never experienced. So it's really hard to put it in a reference. But as far as what you were kind of asking about just with happiness, 
I think it's not like a either or kind of thing. It's, it's more like when we're offering happiness to people, it's, it's in order because we see their worth, you know, and, and, and we see, we want them, we want to offer them warmth and tenderness, and we want to kind of enhance on the, on the path, we want to enhance that capacity within ourselves, right? And in a way, it's a, it's a really interesting question on the Buddhist path, because when we start to talk about more in this ultimate way, ultimate, with ultimate truth, it's like even if I am offering someone, like, let's say the happiness of, I don't know, a good meal, it's still from, it has an element of suffering in it, right? If they're embodied as a person, there still is an element of change and impermanence. But I could still offer them that meal, right? So it doesn't, if we try to search for something that has no suffering in it, it's not possible unless we're just offering them an awakening, which we also do. So like when I do loving kindness practice, I'm also offering people, I, I hope you, you know, may you be awake, may you be enlightened, right? So it's sort of like both and. But it does get tricky because like different people's version, we have different ideas of what happiness is. Yeah, yeah. Some people like to be whipped as their happiness. <laughs> Do I want to be whipped? No, that's not happy to me, right? I, that doesn't, so again, it's no bashing of anyone's preferences. It's just saying like, here in relative reality, it's, it's we, we impute and label and form a consensus on what reality is. You know what I'm saying? As groups and as individuals. So, it's, so I think we have to have some kind of way of working in relative reality. But people use the word a lot, happiness. It's a buzzword. So it's like, who doesn't want to be happy? It is, or, what? I think it just has a very superficial kind of... Of course, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's why I think... It, but it's difficult, because you all can see, as I'm just sort of describing this, what enlightenment is, it's like, come on, like most people, they just glaze over. It's not really, it's very difficult. It, like I said, unless we've studied emptiness a lot and we, or, and we have some experience of it in practice, we just glaze over. But I will say, no matter what, it still is important to think about, even if we're like, I don't know what's going on or what that means. It's still, it's an important thing to connect with. And to, to turn on, because it's sort of like, we do, we are a culture, a quick fix culture, where we want, we want answers now, and we want to know now. In this realm, woo. Like, my, one of the biggest lessons I've learned is just to like, let go of needing to know right now. But continue the path, right? Continue studying and continue practicing. And that's been the best, I would say, that's been one of my, the best tools, because it sort of like allows space, but then efficacy and sort of movement. Yeah. But I think you're right, it is a superficial word, uh, happiness. And, just, you know, we live, we, we live in a marketed, an overstimulated, overmarketed culture. So it's just part of the landscape, you know. That's why Buddhism kind of got equated with happiness. And, you know, it could be just semantics at the end of the day in the sense of, like, how do you define happiness? So, again, we're just using certain terminology in certain ways. Yeah. So, um, I guess like there's a feeling of um, like I, you know it's like I'm happy that this exists and yeah. like, I appreciate that you gave the review so I can be caught up a little in the text um, and then that like that sort of like um, I'm gonna call it like it's a number of people don't like like the whole, like the wholesomeness but like there's some people like oh this is like a good thing um, so I kind of feel like there's like a sort of like a brightness. Um, the way that I've been practicing um, with some of this stuff is like um, kind of noticing, I guess there's like the thing where you notice like, oh, like if I'm feeling pleasure, like there's also like this like grabbing and mm. like craving, but I actually yeah. feel like that's kind of like, oh, that's like I think that's fine, but, um, but it also like kind of like makes my mind go more towards the negative. Um, whereas, like, yeah. you can actually, like, so what I've, what I've, with, like, through the guidance of, like, um, teachings and teachers that have, like, resonated with me, like, I feel like what I'm trying to do with happiness now is, like, um, go, like, you know how, like, when you feel um, pain or, like, you, you're feeling bad, you can think, like, oh, at this moment, like, there's so many other people who are experiencing the same kind of pain. Like, it, I feel like you can do the same like, like my pra I've been trying to practice the same with um, happiness, where it's mm -hmm. like, 
oh, like, I got this thing I want, it feels awesome, um, but it's like, oh, and, like, at the same moment, like, all, you know, all these other people are, like, feeling this, like, yeah. happiness, and so it's, um, it's kind of, like, makes it more, like, yeah. radiant or independent. Like, yeah, I do that too. It's actually yeah. in Lojong. That's a Lojong oh, practice okay. too. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's just using different means. He's kind of focusing more on the, in this particular text, mm-hmm. like on the craving aspect of how it binds us. Mm-hmm. But no, if you, you know, it's, it's all about spaciousness. So it's all about if we can, it's all about clinging actually and recognizing clinging on, on a root perspective. Clinging is a little different than craving. Mm-hmm. Clinging is a little bit more primal. Mm-hmm. And so if we, if what you're doing is you're releasing that clinging because mm-hmm. you're offering it to others, right? So, perfectly fine method, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think we find what works for us. For me, the craving thing didn't work for a long time because it felt like similar, like it would make me feel judgmental of myself. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I think it's, it's real, but like for happiness, sometimes it's nice to yeah. think about craving. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But what I'm saying is like, um, we come into different perspectives in our practice where something then opens and we can use it in a different way. Mm-hmm. So, for me, the idea of, again, I'm not putting it on you, just sharing this. Um, for me, like thinking a lot about craving and craving, it made me like, again, like be a little judgmental towards myself. So I had to more focus on a positive formation of that, like you were saying, like instead offering it or something like that. Now, I don't think of craving like that anymore. It's actually really joyful to work with craving. I'm not saying I'm successful at it (laughs) all the time, but so things do shift in our practice because at the end of the day, we're just talking about we make meaning of that word or term or thing, right? And so when, when things shift, there's other openings to work with different sides of things. Because sometimes that will work of that sharing and sometimes it won't to get at the root. Mm-hmm. Meaning, even like loving kindness and compassion, a meta practice, at a certain stage we have to go beyond the gooey, warm feeling of it and recognize the more spacious, open aspect of it, which is the more wisdom side. So it's, it's a real, you know, these are just ongoing, kind of like, we're plumbing the depths over time, right? But that's wonderful, like, that, that, that aspect. Yeah. Can I ask you a question? Sure. Um, like, I know that in like the, like the wheel, like clinging, clinging and craving are like different points in it, but mm-hmm. um, can you just remind me like experientially, like what the difference is? In clinging and craving? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, Again, these are just semantics because people do use these terms in different ways, right? So I would say clinging is more, it's the close cousin of ignorance. Mm -hmm. So you have ignorance, which is just misapprehending the situation, right? Uh, Whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And then it's like the, when we label something as, when we have a feeling of something being beneficial, Mm -hmm. the clinging just comes right with that. Where the craving is a little bit more like, it's where the, the, the claws get more grippy. Mm-hmm. That's how it feels to me. Mm-hmm. You know, where, where I, the clinging is more root. It's, it's a little like, for instance, I can notice my craving most of the time. Clinging is a little bit harder because it can be more subtle also. Mm-hmm. Where, for instance, uh, for meditators who become very advanced, like at calm abiding practice, um, shamatha, or, or you know, being able to stabilize with the breath or something, they actually cling to that. Would that be craving? Not really, it's, but it's clinging, right? And so as they progress in their path, they're gonna have to let go of that clinging at some point, right? Yeah, so that's how I would define it, yeah. But you might hear different definitions from different teachers. That's good. I've been thinking about that a lot lately. It actually came up in a, I led a day long today, it also came up and it was, um, I mean, some people craving seems to be kind of like, they swap it out for attachment or clinging, yeah. things like that, yeah. Some people make them, uh, what do you call it, synonymous, right? It seems like craving is like when you start to like plot and strategize. Mm, yeah. Make <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Anyways, anything else? <laughs> So maybe we'll close it out, yeah? All right, so what's your name again? Tracy. Tracy, so on your note, Tracy, why don't we just offer up all this goodness, you know? 
uh, whether we came into something uncomfortable or comfortable tonight, we're just offering our effort, we're offering our practice, we're offering kind of the joy of the Dharma in itself. You can do that in whatever way feels comfortable right now in the sense like I like to imagine a field of beings in front of me as vast as space. You can do that in whatever way you'd like, as a feeling, as an image. We're just going to share with them our practice, our effort. If you'd like, just sending them aspirations of awakening, wishing them well, wishing them love. Sure, you can wish them happiness if you'd like. (laughs) Wishing them non-clinging. Wishing them freedom. Thank you so much for coming.